like to start by talking about a virus that has been plaguing the global solar market for the better part of a decade now, and that is the boom-bust cycle. We started to see it first in any serious fashion in 2008 in Spain, when all of a sudden Spain installed nearly three gigawatts of solar over the course of that year, which might not sound like a lot right now, but in 2008 that was <laughs> enormous, and it popped up almost out of nowhere. The government then pulled back on the feed-in tariff program, which is what was supporting all of that demand in Spain. The market crashed and has never recovered. The next year, we saw it happen in the Czech Republic. It was basically exactly the same phenomenon, albeit a little bit smaller. The Czech Republic, which had basically no solar market ahead of time, installed almost two gigawatts over the course of the year. The feed-in tariff was reduced. The market crashed. It never recovered. We saw a huge boom bust in Italy in 2011. This was almost 10 gigawatts installed that year just in Italy. Much of that did not come online that year. This is projects that were getting installed. There was some inverter switching to get projects to start generating so that they could qualify for the feed-in tariff, and then somebody would pull an inverter off of that system and onto another system to get a kilowatt hour out of it. It was a messy time, but they installed almost 10 gigawatts that year to qualify for this very generous feed-in tariff program, which was then reduced. The market since crashed and has never recovered. Then there's Germany, which had a much more extended boom, right? It wasn't this overnight sensation. Germany was the sort of bedrock of the solar market for a very long time, back to its sort of earliest days in recent history. And Germany had about a three-year good run of installing eight gigawatts or so a year of solar. It was supporting the global solar market more than any other country. And during that time, the German government kept reducing the feed-in tariff incrementally, thinking that that would result in the market declining back to their growth corridor, which they wanted to be three or four gigawatts a year. Of course, that wasn't happening. And as a result, they pulled back much more drastically on the feed-in tariff. The market crashed and has not recovered. And then now, we are in sort of the beginning of the bust in the final attractive European solar market, which is the UK, which was the sort of one glimmer of light in solar in Europe uh, the past couple of years, and now the government has pulled back on the incentives, the market has crashed, and it, it's yet to be discovered when and if it will recover. So we've seen a lot of these, um, but what do they have in common across them? A few things. One, obviously these are all European countries, right? And we'll talk in a minute about what that has meant for how solar has developed globally as all of these European markets have popped up and then crashed. Second, they all share a, the same policy mechanism. You know, these markets are actually more similar than they are different in that what they had spurring demand across all these countries was a single national incentive program. It was always a feed-in tariff and it was always uncapped, right? So what basically happened is the government wanted to support solar. Uh, they introduced a feed-in tariff program. That feed-in tariff was pretty generous. It was always above retail electricity prices, so it was an incentive program. But solar gets cheaper faster than governments expect. I think that's basically a truism at this point. And as a result, the market grows faster than governments expect. They start to get a little bit of buyer's remorse. It's a more costly program than they expect. There's political pushback. They overcorrect and reduce the feed-in tariff too much or kill it, or in some cases, like in Spain, even change it retroactively, and the market then falls apart, right? And the third thing that I think is what makes this particularly pernicious, the reason why it's such a negative thing in the long term and something that we don't talk about a lot when we're talking about these markets, is the fact that none of these markets yet have actually seen a recovery. You, know, you think about boom-bust cycles in, in, say, the housing market. After the bust, you usually see you know, housing prices start to creep up again. It doesn't actually take all that long, historically, to get back to pretty healthy pricing. Uh, in these markets, at least thus far, once you see the bust, the market just sort of stagnates. You know, there isn't a new incentive program in place, there isn't much support, there's a bit of a bitter taste in the mouth of policymakers a lot of the time. And that's really bad because it's not a way to build a long-term sustainable growth market for solar. There's no reason why we should have these crashes that remain, you know, stagnant markets for extended periods of time. So apart from just the downside of there being a boom which results in a lot of job creation and economic development that then disappears, it also makes it harder to see this market come back. So this has been a big issue 
across all of these countries over the course of the past decade or so. But we often don't talk about it a whole lot, especially here in the US when we're thinking about the global solar market. And I think the reason for that is that we've basically been lucky in that every time one of these markets starts to crash, another one seems to be on the upswing. In addition to that, we've been on this extended pivot over the past five years or so from Europe as the center of the global solar universe to Asia, and in particular to China and Japan. So during that transition, we've actually never had a down year for solar installations globally. In recent history, that has never happened. We've come close a couple of times in 2012, and again in 2014, the market was effectively flat year over year, but it has never gone down overall. And so we've sort of papered over this boom bust impact by just having another market that is growing at any given time. So does that mean that since we've made this pivot toward Asia, um, which is now the, the center of demand, we have growth in other markets in North America and Latin America and some other markets that we're past this cycle and it is no longer a problem? Unfortunately, no. And in fact, by our estimation, we're right now at the very end of the boom of what will be maybe the biggest boom bust that we've seen yet, and that is Japan. Japan, in a somewhat similar fashion, um, has actually you know, had a feed-in tariff for a long time for residential solar. Japan's long been a small-scale solar market. But a few years ago, introduced a very generous feed-in tariff for larger-scale projects, uncapped, similar story. The market has boomed. It'll be over 11 gigawatts this year, but now we are seeing the government pull back on the incentive program, and our expectation is it will be a slightly more prolonged decline, but a bust nonetheless. So we're still in this cycle to some extent, and we need to get out of it. Uh, it's important for the long-term future of solar. It's important if you want to see costs continue to fall, if you want there to be a truly global market, and if you want solar to have a meaningful impact on climate change. You know, if that's a goal of this industry, then you need to see continued sustainable growth across many markets and not just one popping up and disappearing while another one pops up. So how do you get past that cycle? Pretty simple, solar needs to get cheap enough so that you don't require a program like a feed-in tariff in order to see demand for solar, right? The reason why these markets have been historically so important for solar is that if you remove the feed-in tariff and solar was just competing head-to-head -head against other technologies for new electricity generating capacity or for a homeowner's electricity supply, solar generally wouldn't compete, right? Just wasn't cheap enough yet. And so the question is, how close are we to getting to the point where solar actually can compete and in what conditions? And we're getting closer, I think, than, than you might imagine. And one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about that and the way that it's playing out is that I think there's a misconception that, especially in utility scale solar right now, that we've basically already eked the major cost reductions out of the system. So module costs have come down substantially over the past seven years. Inverter costs have come down. Most of the hardware, you know, soft costs are harder to, to reduce. So generally, we should be seeing very incremental cost reductions, one would expect. And the reality is that's not actually what we're seeing in the market. You can see this across the world. So I'll give you a few examples. And one way to look at this is just comparing the average PPA prices, power purchase agreements that were signed, these are contracts, for utility scale projects in a number of countries just over a nine month period last year. So this is April to December of 2015, not even a full calendar year. In Brazil, we had three auctions and over the course of that nine month period, the average PPA price fell by 8%. So 10% or so on an annualized basis. That's a meaningful cost reduction, especially when we've already taken a lot of the cost out of these systems. Even more impressively, Germany, which is certainly the most mature solar market in the world and the market where you would expect to see the smallest cost reductions at this point, saw a 14% reduction over that same period. And then most notably, India, which is maybe the most exciting market for solar over the next five or 10 years, enormous growth potential, lots of government support for it, saw a 25% reduction in average PPA prices over that same period of time. Again, just over a nine month period. So solar costs continue to fall quite fast, even in the utility scale sector, where you would think there isn't so much room to run downward. The other thing that you can see here is that across all of these markets, we're in a similar price range now for utility scale solar in the like seven to eight cent per kilowatt hour zone. 
which is a good zone to be in. You know, you could sort of compare it to the U.S., right? The, the, in the U.S., the Sunshot program, which is a DOE program, was designed to set an ambitious goal for the cost of solar by the end of this decade on an unsubsidized basis. And their goal was a dollar a watt, which was supposed to work out to about six cents per kilowatt hour. And the idea was six cents per kilowatt hour, more or less, for utility scale solar would compete head to head against other technologies, would make solar stand on its own. So you can easily imagine across all of these markets getting to six cents per kilowatt hour by the end of this decade if we're already at seven or eight cents today. These are all unsubsidized prices. So the cost of solar is falling very fast. Assuming that solar is getting cheap enough that it should start to be able to compete, what is the mechanism through which we're gonna start to see solar grow in a new fashion as a result? Generally speaking, the transition that we're seeing globally is away from markets that are based on a feed-in tariff program where you have a fixed price contract that's offered to all projects and often is uncapped toward one that is based on competitive auctions or competitive tenders. So this is where solar competes either against other solar projects or it competes against sometimes other technologies and the lowest price wins, right? So it's a competitive pricing paradigm wherein you end up with cheaper solar. That's good for the market, it makes it more sustainable, um, and it, it incentivizes cost reduction. And what's been interesting is this is gonna be the first year in 2016 in which we have more major markets that are based on some kind of a competitive tender program than on a feed-in tariff program. We're just crossing that line right now. And in the markets where we are seeing competitive tenders, solar is taking an increasing share. And you can see this in particular, there's, there's a lot of this going on in Latin America, which is a region that we're very excited about and spend a lot of time paying attention to, partially because of this. So let's just look at the last six months or so. In October, Chile held an auction and solar took up about a fifth of the capacity. That was an auction that included some fossil fuels in addition to solar and other renewables. We had a Brazilian auction in November of last year in which solar was almost two thirds of the capacity that won the contracts in that auction. In Peru, in February of this year, solar was almost half of the capacity in an auction that was a multi-technology auction. And then finally, the one that probably has generated the most attention here in the US was Mexico two months ago held an auction that was a multi-technology auction, did in, in fact include some fossil fuels in addition to solar and wind um, and renewable energy technologies, and solar was almost two-thirds of the capacity. This is just solar winning out over other technologies on a completely unsubsidized basis. And, you know, I mentioned that average PPA prices in these other markets are in the seven or eight cent per kilowatt hour range. Well, in Mexico, we had some projects that were sub four cents per kilowatt hour. So there's a pretty wide band, and the lowest end of the range is incredibly low at this point. So that is a dramatic transformation that we are in the very early stages of for solar globally. One in which solar starts to compete as a resource that can just provide electricity generation at an effective and a low price um, and cleaner than many other technologies. It's going to be a slow shift. I don't think you should expect this to happen overnight, but I guess I wanted to show these numbers just to prove that it is real and it is already happening across many countries globally. You put solar on that stage where it's not dependent on a, a single government incentive program, it's not dependent on, on subsidies of any kind, and all of a sudden the market potential, the total addressable market for solar jumps by an order of magnitude. So this is really exciting, but it's a long-term phenomenon, right? And our expectation is the benefit of this transition is that in the near term, we will continue to see steady, albeit somewhat incremental growth globally for solar. You know, so we'll go from 66 gigawatts of solar installed this year to nearly 100 gigawatts by the end of the decade. That's meaningful growth. 100 gigawatts of solar in a single year would certainly be an impressive feat. But you can't expect the curve to go too steep too soon because right now we're in the sort of growing pain stage of figuring out how solar can compete on its own two legs. The other thing that's interesting about the global market that you might note here, and also in the conversation that we've been having so far, is that everything that I've been talking about relates primarily to utility scale solar. One of the interesting things is if you take a purely sort of US focused perspective, we spend a lot of time in the US talking about distributed solar, residential and commercial solar. Um, it's largely a US phenomenon at this point. We do have a couple other markets globally that have 
meaningful demand for residential or commercial solar. We have Japan, we have Australia, we have Germany. But for the most part on the global scale, and in a lot of these markets where you have solar competing on an emerging basis, it's primarily utility scale at this point. So for all of you in the room, we're focused on distributed solar. I think one of the interesting questions over the longer term is what is it going to take to see distributed solar pick up in all these other markets? Do we need net metering across these markets or are there other mechanisms through which we're going to see this kind of growth? So, you know, we're talking about how solar is going to grow, but focus mostly on a global perspective. What about the U.S. where we sit now? I haven't really mentioned the U.S. yet because the U.S., if you're thinking about it in terms of the global solar market, is, is somewhat unique and a little bit weird. Everything about the U.S. is different from every other market. So you can't really relate anything that's going on here to what's going on in other countries for the most part. So let's talk about what's going on here. If we had had this conversation, if this conference had been six months ago, then I would have had a really nice clean narrative where I would have been talking about booms and busts and I would have said, well, the U.S. is heading for a similar boom and a bust, right? This is our forecast for what was going to happen to the U.S. solar market prior to the extension of the investment tax credit. So the expectation was, and I still think this would have been more or less correct, we would have seen this huge boom this year in 2016 ahead of ITC expiration, followed by a pretty meaningful crash in 2017. That crash would have been the biggest in the utility scale sector, but it would have been a down year, the first down year in recent history for distributed solar as well. And it would have taken a few years for us to get back to par and then growing again. We, there would have been some jobs lost. It would have been a, you know, a time to batten down the hatches and try to rebuild the business. So we were heading for a boom bust in the US, but of course that bust was averted thanks to a really great five-year, effectively seven-year extension of the investment tax credit that took place in December. Roan Rush, the CEO of SIA, is in the audience. You can all thank him for that at some point during this conference. So we're in a whole new world, right? We have an ITC extension. We have visibility basically into 2023, which is almost unprecedented. That's a really long time from now. We know what the ITC is going to be that long into the future. So is everything fine and dandy? Not exactly, but it's a particularly interesting time to look at what's going on in solar in the US. So let's start with looking at utility scale solar. Um, utility scale solar, even prior to ITC extension, has been on a roll. We look at the overall pipeline for utility scale solar in the US, and the pipeline is just projects that have PPAs in place. Um, every time a project comes online, it goes out of the pipeline. So if one project gets completed, another one has to replace it. And that pipeline has been pretty steadily, incrementally growing for a while now. That's something you would expect out of a growing market. But over the past year, in 2015, we saw a huge boom. It grew 41% just over the course of the year, went from about a 14 gigawatt pipeline to 20 gigawatts. 20 gigawatts is a huge pipeline relative to the size of the market. This was a 7.2 gigawatt overall solar market in the US last year and a four gigawatt utility scale market. So we had a 20 gigawatt pipeline. Um, what was even crazier about that is that almost all of those projects were supposed to come online this year because everybody was trying to get those projects done ahead of ITC expiration. So you had this totally unprecedented pipeline to be developed this year. Then the ITC gets extended, and of course, a lot of developers would like to push those projects out. There were going to be lots of issues with getting those projects done this year. Interconnection issues, EPC crunch issues, financing issues, potentially supply crunch of modules and inverters. All these reasons why you'd like to push it back, but there are a lot of financial penalties in a lot of these contracts in order to do that. So just to take a snapshot of where we are right now in this market, because I think it's particularly fascinating, so we installed you know, four gigawatts, a little over four gigawatts of utility scale solar last year. There was a pipeline of almost 20 gigawatts, 18.7 of that 20 gigawatts that was supposed to come online this year. That's a huge boom. So far, we've seen 1.2, we just heard about another one, so it's closer to 1.5 gigawatts of projects that have publicly announced that they're going to spill over at least into 2017. Uh, we've all, you know, that leaves another 17 gigawatts of projects that are supposed to come online this year. We've already installed 650, 700 megawatts, something like that. You know, it's always a slow first quarter for utility scale solar in the U.S., so that's to be expected. 
Then there's this question of how much of this additional capacity is going to get delayed, how much of this will get pushed out. So this is what we're spending all of our time on. Um, and honestly, who knows? We have a, you know, an estimate, but I won't pretend that this is going to be exact. Right now, we're expecting that it's about 5 gigawatts additional. So that's a lot. But even given that, it still means we're going to install close to 12 gigawatts of utility scale solar this year. So the market will effectively triple from last year, despite the fact that we have the ITC extension. The result of that is going to be we are still going to have what looks a little bit like a boom-bust cycle, but it's sort of a false relic of the fact that there was such enormous pipeline growth. But stepping back to why this is all happening, it's because utility-scale solar in the U.S. is extraordinarily competitive now. Average PPA prices for utility-scale solar in this country fell below six cents a kilowatt hour on average in the U.S. last year. Right? This is including the ITC, so that's the distinction primarily between the U.S. and these other countries that we've mentioned. This year, the likelihood is that the average PPA price will be below $0.05 cents a kilowatt hour. That creates an enormous potential for demand um, outside of renewable portfolio standards, just out of pure need for new electricity generation capacity for utilities all over the country. There's some regional variation in what it costs to build utility-scale solar now, uh, an average turnkey Fixed tilt utility scale project might be $1.25 a watt in the southeast. It might be $1.40 a watt in the northeast. But you can see how close we're getting to that so-called holy grail of $1 a watt. It's not crazy to imagine that for certain projects by the end of this decade, we're going to be there. So utility scale solar looks very strong. The same cannot be said for commercial solar in the U.S. Despite the ITC extension, we are, you know, we've had a, a four-year run of sort of steady incremental growth for utility-scale solar. Uh, commercial solar has been effectively flat to slightly down during that whole period. So we think a lot about, and we talk a lot about how fast the solar market is growing. That has just not been true for commercial solar. And there are many reasons that you can point to. You know, the common ones have to do with creditworthiness of the off-taker, customer acquisition costs. There have been incentive issues at state levels, lots of reasons for it. Um, but I think the more important point is that I don't think anybody has really figured out the solution just yet. But I do think there's a, a trend right now that's just starting but is worth monitoring. Um, and that is this emerging landscape of integrated CNI energy management. So before we get to that, you know, one of the issues with commercial solar is that it's still a very fragmented landscape. You have, you know, a small number of national, multi-regional developers who are building out projects, uh, and they do a good business, but even they, all together, account for a smaller market share than the top five players do in residential solar. You have much more co consolidation in residential than you do in commercial. And then in commercial, you also have a, a pretty strong list of regional developers who are actually very strong in the regions in which they focus. Um, but one of the issues is that with commercial solar, you see projects changing hands a lot. So you'll have the proverbial two guys in a credit card sign up a customer. They'll flip a project to one of these regional developers. They'll get the project so far, but then they, they're not going to finance it or do construction financing themselves. They want to sell it to a larger developer. A larger developer buys it. Ultimately, they don't want to own it for the long term, so they sell it to somebody who has a yield co or somebody else who's a long-term owner. All those transactions have costs and add costs to the system. It just makes it tougher for the market to scale. So you have this fragmented landscape. But what I think is interesting right now is the conversion, um, or the convergence, rather, between the commercial solar landscape and all these other energy management landscapes. So you, know, you have all these little distributed energy resource providers, some of them not so little, solar companies that we mentioned, but also energy storage providers, other point solution type things. Uh, who are figuring out ways to offer multiple solutions to customers. You know, solar, energy storage, load control, demand response, at retail energy procurement, off-site energy procurement, right? It, these things are starting to sort of bleed into each other. But it's not just the solar companies that are doing it. You have all these ESCOs, energy service companies that have been doing energy efficiency in this way for years, are now adding solar and other technologies to their mix. You have large tech conglomerates that want to be selling their technology into commercial customers and are trying to do that by offering these multi-solution offerings. The most famous of these probably is GE, which has a business that's built called Current, basically based off of this idea. And then I think most interestingly right now, lots and lots of utility affiliates, these are the unregulated arms of utilities, are getting into this business as well, starting to figure out how to cobble together multiple technologies to offer something to a suite of particularly large commercial customers 
perhaps the best known of these would be Edison Energy, Southern California Edison's new subsidiary that has made a few acquisitions, is putting them all together, and is trying to offer this, this landscape. I think what's going to be interesting about this over the next few years is that you could imagine there's a point five years from now when the commercial solar market basically doesn't exist as a standalone, but instead has become integrated into this broader landscape of companies that are offering commercial customers a one-stop shop for their energy needs, sometimes doing it as a service. So that's the commercial market. How about the residential market? Um, the residential market right now is getting, uh, to the extent that there are public companies, it's getting beat up pretty bad on Wall Street. And you know, there's a number of reasons for that. But you know, I think the first point to make is that the residential solar market has been growing over 50% a year for years now. Uh, and that's going to slow down in part just because it has to. right? So if you look at the top players in the residential solar market and the ones for whom we have public data, and you compare that to the overall market, Here's what's been happening in the past few years. In 2014, this was all about sort of share grabbing for the large players. This is Solar City in the residential business, Vivint, Sunrun. The three of them in aggregate more than doubled over the course of that year. The market itself grew 60%, so they were gaining share. Last year, growth slowed a little bit for all of them, and it was more in line with the overall growth of the market. In other words, they were growing on pace with the smaller installers. You think of these big players as dominating the market, but actually, in more recent history, you know, everybody's been growing at, at effectively the same clip. But if you look at their 2016 guidance and what we expect for the overall market, um, it's going to slow. And in fact, this is before SolarCity just updated its guidance for this year, so in fact, their guidance is even a little bit lower than that. I think this is a more sustainable growth pace for residential solar. I don't think this is necessarily to be looked at as a negative thing. We're not going to be growing 50% a year for the foreseeable future. We think 30% a year this year, and then it'll start to slow down a little bit. Incremental growth, but consistent and continual growth in the residential market. And the reason for that is that if you look at all the states in the country, you look at the cost to build residential solar across all of these states, you look at the actual rate structures under which these customers operate, um, and you look at the state level incentives that are available, there are about 20 states right now that are at so-called grid parity, where you can offer a customer a 20-year contract with a low escalator that is at the same rate as their current retail electricity price, accounting for things like fixed charges. There are 14 of those states that actually are really in the money because you don't want to offer a customer equivalent price. You want to offer them savings. So say it's 10% savings is the tipping point. That's 14 states. And those happen to be the 14 states where we see a fair amount of residential solar in the US right now. So it's still an attractive market in all of those states. If you build that forward to 2020, assuming solar costs continue to fall, assuming incentives expire as they are currently scheduled to expire, nothing else is introduced, and assuming nothing else changes, which is a key point, we'll be at 42 states by 2020. A lot more states enter the money in the next few years, and 28 of those states will be at the so-called tipping point. So absent other changes, the residential solar market has an extraordinarily bright near-term future. Of course, the reality is that things are changing, right? And in particular, things are changing with regard to rate structures and net energy metering. You can already see one of these in that, if you're looking very, very carefully, the very last state on this list is Nevada, right? Nevada, since we've incorporated the actual changes in Nevada, by 2020 becomes the single worst state in the country for residential solar um, as a direct result of the changes to net metering and, and electricity rates in that state. It's not a Nevada-specific phenomenon. There's this great report that looks at states that have taken any kind of action on net metering, on residential rate structures, on residential third-party ownership. Um, and they found that in 2015, uh, this is the list of states that took no action. Right? So four states did nothing on this issue last year. That means that 46 states did something. So, so something is changing across all these markets. doesn't all get a ton of attention because not all of it is nearly as drastic as what happened in Nevada and not all of it is negative for solar. Um, but things are changing under our feet and I think sort of we need to recognize that. The reality is that these changes, they're not always killing the market, but they certainly can. So if you look at you know, the 20 states that we mentioned are at grid parity today. And then if you just go across all those 20 states and you were to say, well, what happens if we add fixed charges to all these customers' bills? If you add a $10 fixed charge across all these customers' bills, you lose five states immediately, right? So it doesn't kill all the markets. Some markets are still 
relatively lucrative, but it, it kills some. If you introduce a $50 a month fixed charge, you've killed the solar market in the US, or at least the residential solar market. The other thing that's sort of in vogue right now, demand charges, residential peak demand charges. If you introduce a very small $5 per kilowatt peak demand charge, you still actually do have a pretty meaningful impact on some of these markets. Obviously, this depends on the customer's load profile, and this is assuming they don't install things like load control and energy storage, but it has a big impact on solar on its own. And obviously, the bigger the demand charge, the bigger the impact. And then finally, the third thing that we're seeing is changes to net metering, where instead of feeding power back into the grid at the retail rate, it's something lower than the retail rate. If you do an export rate discount of 10%, this is sort of more or less what California did in the NEM 2.0 decision, um, you don't lose much there. Solar can sort of weather that across most states. But if it's a 50% discount, then you do lose a bunch of states. And it's worth noting Nevada went from about 11 cents per kilowatt hour retail to about 3 cents per kilowatt hour retail or uh, export. So far more than a 50% export discount is why that market looks so bad. So this is all just to say, you know, these things are changing and uh, I think it, we have to recognize that, but it's super important, the structure of these changes, the nature and the magnitude in order to understand what it's going to do to the solar market. And, you know, you can look at sort of a study in opposites of what happened in Nevada where there's a very contentious, very negative for solar result, um, particularly negative in that there is a retroactive change to net metering. Ex existing customers face it as well. Um, that's a huge and totally unique problem that Nevada faced versus New York where, you know, we're seeing very pro progressive collaborative activity between solar companies and utilities to propose the next iteration of residential solar compensation in a way that, you know, reflects the value of those resources to the grid but also provides a, a healthy bridge to the future so that there is enough time to sort of build it into your planning. So there are ways in which these changes can occur that are productive and there are ways that they can occur that are not. So where does that leave us? Uh, like I said, we're still going to look like we have a little bit of a boom bust in the US. I wouldn't pay too much attention to it, right? Doesn't mean a whole lot. Just means we're going to build a lot of utility scale solar this year. Our expectation then is that the market continues to grow. We see no reason why we'll see a halting in growth in solar in the US over the next few years across all sectors. This includes the commercial market. We, we keep predicting that it's going to grow each year. And one of these times, we're going to be right. And uh, you know, it should continue to grow to a pretty meaningful size. By the end of this decade, we're going to be approaching 20 gigawatts a year. We hit 20 gigawatts cumulative last year, and we're going to be doing that every year by around the end of this decade. It's an extraordinarily exciting time for solar in the U.S. And just to close out, I will say, you know, we've had nine of these solar summits. I've been at seven of them. This is my seventh. Um, and every single year I come away from this conference feeling exhausted and sick of talking to you all, but also <laughs> invigorated and excited by all the amazing, broad, ex you know, new innovative ideas that are taking place throughout every facet of the solar industry. This conference for me is just the place where I come away uh, feeling more positive than any other place about where solar is headed in the US and globally, and I can't wait to hear from you all. So thank you very much. Thank you.